Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I know folks are still getting food. We are so happy that this is such a large crowd, but then that comes with we apologize that there's a line. But for the interest of time, I'm just going to do some housekeeping things. My name's Kelly Delaney. I'm the Director of Development at the Drupal Association. And when um, the sessions came through for DrupalCon, um, I specifically saw this session and I said, this would be so amazing to have as a uh, Women in Drupal keynote. And you all thought the same thing because this is the largest crowd we've ever had. So thank you for coming. And I wanted to also thank our sponsor of this uh, event, Tag One. My friend June always supports, and she was in here putting out napkins and helping us. So thank you very much, Tag One. And then last thing, non-sponsored, but one of our um, Drupal community organizations called Spry Digital, based in St. Louis, their, co their CEO is a woman, and she participated in writing this book called Growth. And it's about, it's over, let's see, over 40 women share their inspiring stories, stepping into courage, leading from the heart, and personal evolution. And they gave me the opportunity to hand it out to one of you. And so before y'all got here, it was very high tech. I put a napkin on the left side of your chair. It's red. And I know someone's already sitting there. Come on, I can, she's looking. Okay, I'm going to walk over there. So that would be the winner. I'm going to bring this free book. All right, y'all, I know you're all standing in line, but I do think this is a great conversation. This will be like the best line standing you'll ever do listening to um, this group speak. So I'm going to turn it over to Shanice now from Four Kitchens. All these ladies are from Four Kitchens. Testing, testing. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you, Kelly, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this event. Um, we're both honored and excited to be here um, and share our own personal experiences in the lonely only space. Um, we created this session wanting to keep things women-centric and also touch on some DEIB uh, undertones. And we figure instead of waxing poetic on data and numbers, we were just gonna tell our stories from our experience. Um, and you will notice there are some underlying themes that definitely travel throughout all of our stories. Um, there will be some questions as we go through this process. So please, we encourage you to participate. Uh, we also hope that you find your own shred of truth that resonates either in all of our stories or with some of them in particular. And um, along the way, um, aside from the questions, we'll save Q&A for the end. Uh, we hope that you have some feedback as well as maybe wanting to share some of your own story with us. Uh, with that said, I will pass this off to Sebastiana to kick us off. Thank you so much, Shanice. I'm Sebastiana Skaliski. I'm a content strategist at Four Kitchens. Uh, when I started working on the web, it was just freelance, side hustle. I never actually thought it would be a career trajectory or a path I wanted to take for myself. I had friends who worked in tech. They were from underrepresented groups, and they did not have the best of experiences. So I just kind of thought maybe that's not a space where I want to place myself. Uh, but ultimately, when it actually became my career, it was at a liberal arts college, which is slightly different than your normal tech experience. First of all, we had way more women representing, which I love. And the student culture also really held the institution accountable to progress, which just, it set up a great environment. So my first true lonely only moment came when I attended my first professional conference. And unlike this amazing room where I see so many women and so many representations. It was a multi-day event with exactly one female speaker. And um, so I'm just gonna ask a show of hands. Have you ever attended a professional event in the tech space where there was maybe one lady presenting? Yep, 
Yep. How about as an attendee, were you of a handful of women perhaps attending? And did you wind up in promotional shots that were used by the group? Yes. All right. It's resonating. That happened to me two years in a row for a particular conference, which I loved. They had good intentions. They wanted to demonstrate inclusivity. They were probably thinking, if we have photos of women, women will come. But that's about all that they did. You know, they didn't, they didn't stop to actually think about, like, why aren't women here? <laughs> and, you know, these conferences, they were great. They had amazing speakers. I learned so much, but I did not have the same experience as the men that were attending. I didn't have a sense of community. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but a room full of drunk tech bros when you're like one of five women sounds like the beginning of a rarely nasty Keith Morrison episode of Dateline where my smile lights up a room and I'm never seen again. And that's not how I want to live my life. So, you know, the sponsor parties, that wasn't appealing. It was, it was just a whole situation. And even worse, I just kind of internalized all of that. And maybe I could have put myself out there more, but instead I just pulled back. I didn't network. I didn't go to those events. I just kind of attended panels and stuck to myself. And for me, that's one of the most insidious aspects of the Lonely Only experience is that we just take that on. And it manifests as imposter syndrome, which will be a recurring theme, I'm sure. And then we just silence ourselves. So I just want to give a quick shout out to that lonely only, Christina Halverson, a legendary content strategist and trailblazer. I'm so happy that they invited her to speak because her perspective changed my entire viewpoint on what the web was even for. And it, it informed my entire career trajectory. And all I could think of is like, how many other life-changing experiences were missed because women weren't in that space? Well, looping back to the promo photos, the good news is that that could have been the end of the story where they're like, we tried, we showed photos, nobody showed up. But instead, they actually wanted to change that space and they recognized they were failing. So they got on stage and they called themselves out and they're like, hey, we see this as a problem. What do, what do we need to do to get you to actually like submit talks? And so they engaged in conversation with the community and they really listened and they transformed the entire space. And before you know it, it was no longer a sea of white male faces and I had to stand in the line for the bathroom, which, you know, <laughs> fine. <sighs> So all of that, it really reinforced for me, like, you know, change is possible if you actually do it. You have to do the thing. It has to come from the top. You have to prioritize it. It can't be a one and done. And we need help. It can't just be us changing things for the better. Um, we need everybody to participate. And so this is one of the things I actually love about Four Kitchens, because I'm going to humble brag about our company here. We go out of our way to break down taboos about having conversations about things like imposter syndrome. Um, we have little things in place that are actually big. Like when you join the company, immediately it's like, hey girl, there's a women in 4K Slack channel that is automatically a safe space where you can have community and you don't even have to worry about it. Like your people are here for you. And we have women in leadership. And we have awesome women up here. And we really, really try to support each other. And I've also taken my role in the creative team and just in content and UX in general as an opportunity for advocacy. Huge shout out to Randy Ost. He's the creative director at Four Kitchens. He does the work. Every conversation we have, he actively seeks out feedback. He wants different perspectives. He wants to make a space for others. And I feel like we can all do that a little bit in our day to day. Our choices can either help or harm. We can lift others up or we could just be in it for ourselves. And so I'm calling out today. These inclusive practices, we can build better spaces. And so the next time you're in a room, if you look around and everybody just looks exactly like you, you might need to start asking questions about why that is and start working on transforming it. And then together, we can make everything a better place. And with this, I pass it to my friend, Jenna. Thank you, my friend. Um, so, <clears throat> hi, everybody. 
Yes, um, Sebastiana, I love all my web chefs, but Sebastiana is also one of my partners in crime because we are both um, Philly girls, so we bonded over that quite quickly when we joined up with the company because we like to get up to lots of Philly shenanigans. So, um, But like I said, I'm Jenna Harris-Mosley, and anybody that I've made friends with this week or at past conferences or talked to, it will probably be quite clear that I am on the sales team uh, because I'm very big on engaging with the people, talking to people, having conversations about any and everything. So please come up and um, talk to me, tap me on the shoulder, and let's have a conversation before um, we leave Portland if I haven't talked to you yet. But like I said, I'm a part of the three-headed sales monster um, on uh, at Four Kitchens, and I am um, holding down the female contingent on our department. So, um, But before my foray into the tech industry, I was actually a teacher and a social worker, which probably makes even more of my personality make sense. So um, I was um, always really big on engagement with people, so I'm going to ask a, good, a couple questions too. Um, and I'm also a visual learner, so it gives me an idea who I'm looking at. So raise your hand if you've ever been the um, only woman in your department. Okay. Um, raise your hand if you are also the primary caregiver for your family, whether it's you're a mom or you care for an elder parent or you're a spouse, something of this nature. Okay. So um, raise your hand if you're the only black person in your department. And now raise your hand if you're the only black person at your organization. So that's like definitely very key to my story um, as a thread um, through all throughout my life, starting with school and having just that intersectionality of where like I'm a black woman, but I'm also a woman. Am I a black woman first? What does that look like? Then you add motherhood onto it, and there's like you know all these layers to these different things, which automatically informs how I show up in the world and how I do things. And so a lot of my lonely only experience started really when I was in middle school and I was often the only um, black girl in my, um, I was actually the only black girl in like the lower school of a school that went from like kindergarten to eighth grade for a while. And then, you know, going into, and then I went to what I like to call affectionately, not just Canada, but the great white North because I went to school in New Hampshire. And I went to um, Dartmouth College where it's like, you know, not just the snow, but like basically a sea of whiteness, and then there's like me, hi, how are you, and as well as some other people. So I'm very used to used to the thinking of the lonely only as um, a thing that was actually like a black thing. I always thought that was like, you know, about, you know, being just like the only one and having to represent for the whole squad. And so one of those things that was always instilled upon me was that like, you know, go after different educational aspects because that can never be taken away from you. And then you can always be seen as a cut above because I think it will resonate with a lot of the brown and black people in this room of how it's often instilled in us that we have to be twice as good as somebody else to get anywhere. So not only did Dartmouth give me the most financial aid, but it was also an Ivy League school. So I slid on over to there to do my education and I made sure I wanted to parlay that for the future so I could you know, work that good diploma like a part-time job to help open doors for me. And part of that is because I will also want to open doors for other people. So I've be, always been really big on this aspect of like lift as you climb, which that was always in the back of my mind as a popular quote, but I actually learned through um, like kind of preparing myself to be speaking to you all today that that was actually a quote that came from the National Association of Colored Women that was originally started by people like Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells and I was like oh that you know resonates perfectly for the things that I'm talking about and the person that I am. So all of this like lift as you climb like you know I like to kick the door down and try to leave it open so I can reach behind me to bring other people with me and that's kind of part of my thing but you know that's because that has been done for me by like a lot of women um, that I know starting with my mom and my sister who you know also went to college I'm not the first woman in my family to ever go to college my mom actually likes to tell this joke that like she was like well you're so smart because I was at community college when I was pregnant with you so you went to college twice so I was like I'll take it <laughs> so um, and you know I had those opportunities that were given to me me, not just because you know I'm so smart and a cut above everybody else but you know certain opportunities were um, extended to me and I'm aware that that's because you know I'm lucky for the network that I had and the people that I was around and there are lots of people who are plenty smarter than me and probably work harder that you know could be there but they don't have the access so that's a part of it too um, so in that nature of trying to be more inclusive and make room for other people and you know pull people up with me so that like you know we can change the landscape of different spaces that we might not have been historically a part of. 
I made sure to join the DEI uh, team at Four Kitchens. We actually have um, a diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion, and belonging practice, and I had to make sure as, you know, um, a woman in the industry, as a woman of color, that I was on that team to make sure those voices were heard and that we're looking at hiring practices and looking at opportunities that we are mindful about, um, you know, people that, you know, somebody else, if that's not your community, you might not think about that first. Also for women, because I think we looked around at like, though we have a pretty even split of women and men at Four Kitchens, um, there's not as many moms um, on the team. So that's important too because, um, you know, being a mom automatically affects everything I do. I was up at 4.30 this morning to wish my daughter a good day of school on the East Coast because I was, I'm not going through the whole day without talking to my baby. So like, you know, and that's me and like, you know, other people, um, you know, might not do the same or maybe you move differently, but I know that's important for me. And so one of the things that like I, is important to me about working at Four Kitchens in a, in a tech space and work in general is that I feel like I found a place that helps me show up as I really am um, and that I can be myself. So, you know, if my baby is sick and she's home from school, she might show up and stand up, and that's gonna have to be okay with everybody. And so there are ways that like, you know, I, like I said, I'm on the sales team, if I'm drafting a contract and I have to go pick up my child from daycare, well that contract's gonna wait until after bath time and bedtime and then I'll get back to it then. And I never expect people to, you know, contact me like after hours, but it's nice for me to have that flexibility as a mom to be able to show up as I can um, and be competitive with um, you know other people who may not be the primary caregiver in their household. Because I clock out of four kitchens and I clock into mommy time, so you know it's a lot of work. Um, but like I said, I'm just happy that I'm at a place that honors the person that I am and that I can be because you know not everybody has that at the orgs that they work at, and so I'm happy that that's a uh, reality over here, so. And I'll let Laura wrap us up. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Jenna. Um, again, my name is Shanice. I'm the director of projects at Four Kitchens. And I actually started off in advertising. Um, back in the early 2000s, if anyone's familiar with the show Mad Men, that's exactly what it was. Um, account executives were cute ornamental things that dealt with client conflict, did not make any high-level decisions, and they were just purely or ornamental. Um, with that said, how many of you knowingly have received a role or opportunity because of the way you look? And then inversely, how many of you have been passed up for an opportunity because of the way you look? Yep. All that to say that appearance discrimination absolutely sucks. It is very much prevalent, and it becomes that cloak of imposter syndrome that becomes like a second skin. You wear it, you learn how to live in it, you function in it, and before you know it, it has become a part of your identity. And that's something that I had to learn to overcome in regards to my own imposter syndrome and starting at Four Kitchens. I got hired there in August of 2021 as a technical project manager. And at that time, I had already been a project manager for about 10 years. I had the experience. I had built successful client relationships. Did I want to step into leadership? No, because I wasn't good enough. I didn't have enough skills. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't possibly lead a team of people doing what I already knew how to do really well. Um, at that time, the director of projects was a male, and he had stepped down, and the company was looking for a new director of projects. And the email was sent internally, which to me was a huge feather in Four Kitchens cap because they were looking to fill that role with someone they already had on staff. They weren't looking externally, they were looking internally first. And Something told me to throw my resume in the ring. I applied with two other male colleagues, one of which already had nine years tenure on me, so that was intimidating in and of itself. Um, but surprise, here I am, I got the job. <laughs> I got the job. Um, my first month in the position, I will say, was a fire hose to the face. Um, learning all the things, process-driven, trying to recalibrate a team that had become a bit dysregulated and, you know, on their own. Um, I remember having a one-on-one -on -one with our director of tech strategy, Dave Hansen Lang, and he looked at me and he said, how are you doing? How are you settling into the seat? And I was like, ah, oh, this is, you know, I'm learning so much. I was all excited. I had all these things I wanted to do. And he looked at me with a very blank face 
And he said, that's not what I'm talking about. And at that point, I was confused because I had no clue what he was talking about. And he looked at me and said, how do you feel about being the only woman on a team of four white middle-aged males? Mic drop, Dave Hansen Lang, <laughs> gut punch to me. <laughs> um, that's when I really realized that my seat had weight, not only for myself and the path that I was trying to navigate, but also for any other female that was going to come after me or fulfill another role at Four Kitchens. Um, so being the lonely only does come with great responsibility. Um, and I like to look at myself as the DEIB trifecta. I am the only woman on my team. I am Latina and I'm also lesbian. So I represent a multitude of diverse, you know, uh, underrepresented communities. Um, one of my biggest responsibilities in this seat is something called peopling. Um, it's what we affectionately refer to as, you know, uh, staffing our projects. Uh, people are not resources, they're people, so we call them peopling. Um, I take this seriously because I look at things from a big three perspective. Um, Four Kitchens is a fully distributed team. We have uh, web chefs in Canada, Costa Rica, and the US. So the first thing I look at is team makeup, is the right mix of folks in that team represented from all of our locations. Um, the second thing I look at is who's ready for more? And yes, I am looking at all of you shy, amazing individual contributors who are scared to take the leap. I will see you, I will advocate for you, and we will make that next step together. Um, and last but not least, is there a woman in the house on any project? I at least need one, if not more, than one female represented. Uh, sometimes we get lucky, and I was just telling Ilya, our uh, chief operating officer, that it would be lovely to people an entire project with just female web chefs one day. I have a dream, it'll happen. Um, as far as being a woman on the delivery team, I have to say that my four white middle-aged counterparts are exceptionally supportive. They always hear my voice, they recognize where it's coming from. I never feel like I have to fight for you know, my expertise to be known and respected. So with that said, I think that as gut-punching of a question that was from Dave Hansen Lang, it opened my eyes to just everything that comes with being a woman in general and being able to, as Jenna mentioned, lift as you climb. So with that, I will pass it over to Laura. She will round us out. Thank you, Shanice. Thank you, Sebi. Thank you, Jenna, for your wonderful stories. I love them all. So we've heard from content strategy. We've heard from biz dev. We've heard from delivery. And now we're going to round out this project with an engineer. I'm a senior back-end engineer, and uh, when I st I've been working with Drupal for over 16 years. When I started working in web development, I didn't know any other women that were doing it. Uh, and that has slowly been changing, and it seems like Drupal is actually um, pretty good uh, in terms of having a good ratio, better than a lot of other corners of web development. Uh, but I think it's still pretty common to feel like the only lonely in the engineering department. Uh, I've reflected over the years about what has drawn me to such a male-dominated industry, and I think what it boils down to is that I was introduced to it at a really early age. Uh, my dad is an engineer, uh, a uh, software engineer, and he taught me how to program when I was 14. Uh, he had like side projects that he was working on and uh, and so my first job when I was a teenager was uh, making splash splash pages and UI elements for his uh, side projects and, and I loved it it was uh, it was great and who doesn't want to get paid to like solve puzzles when you're 14 years old um, it didn't cross my mind at that time that that could be a viable a career path for me. I definitely saw myself more in, uh, I liked literature, I saw myself going into journalism, and in university I studied, uh, I studied literature and women's studies. And I also, in university, started working for this publication, a humor publication called Golden Words, which was put out by the engineering department at, at Queen's University in Canada. And, um, 
And that uh, was my first major lonely only experience. Uh, it was, it, so Golden Words is like a satire publication. It's part absurdist. Uh, it, it, it is full of very questionable humor. It has, uh, you know, sex jokes abound. It has speculation about like which departments were the sluttiest. It has something called the boob crossword, which was a regular feature. And it's not really surprising that I was the only woman working on it. But yeah, Golden Words also had a website and I became really interested in web publication. And I, again, I think it was because of my programming background that I felt uh, I felt confident to sort of elbow my way in there and start figuring out HTML and CSS. And so, yeah, at the end of fourth year, I started traveling and I needed money. And it became clear that journalism was not gonna provide a lot of great opportunities for making a lot of money, especially here in Portland, which is where I ended up. And so I did what everybody that I knew in Portland was did, which was get a job as a bartender. And I also started making websites for local businesses. Uh, the, at that time, it seemed like a lot of lo local businesses were just starting to discover that they needed a website. And they would advertise on Craigslist, and I happily took those jobs and built my very Portlandy portfolio of tattoo shops and bicycle shops and coffee shops. Uh, and along the way, I met other people uh, that were building websites and other people that had agencies and I met Drupal people. And I started eventually working for small agencies and I was almost always the only woman working for whatever small company. Hand, hands up if you've been the only wo woman at working at, at your company before. Yep. Uh, so that is a pretty common experience. Um, and there were definitely times when I felt like, you know, I was invading the boys club and I wasn't welcome. Uh, I developed sort of strategies of ingratiating myself, which often involved telling dirty jokes that I learned at Golden Words. Um, but yeah, I've also had great male allies along the way. Uh, at my first larger agency, uh, I had a manager that got me to um, oversee the submission of, of, of DrupalCon sessions. And he offered uh, to speak with me. He sort of explained that you don't really have much of a shot at getting accepted to, to speak at DrupalCon unless you've spoken before or you're co-presenting with someone else who's spoken before and he offered to co-present with me. So yeah, back in 2018, we did uh, sort of, we took this presentation on the road and, uh, and that was the beginning of, you know, what became, this is, you know, many presentations later, now I'm inviting my coworkers to present with me, which is, yeah, which is very fun. And uh, I think there are a lot of ways that all of us can, as we advance, can help our more junior colleagues find opportunities to lead and to speak, which I know from experience uh, goes a long way to helping to overcome imposter syndrome. Uh, so I try to remind myself of that a lot. Uh, when I started working at larger agencies, I was really happy, and especially at Four Kitchens, because the overall balance of women tends to be a lot better, even if there are not many women in engineering. Uh, the overall balance at the company is such that there's a really supportive and lovely community of women there. And yeah, the first person I talked to at Four Kitchens was our lovely HR person, Sabra, who is just the most kind and funny person. And then at 8.30 on the day that I started, I got a text message from, from Jenna, uh, who said, uh, you know, hey, welcome. Uh, I'm new here too. I can show you new people things. And by the way, everybody here is very supportive and you're gonna have a lot of support while, while you're here, uh, which is really, really nice. And I've always told myself to be, be like Jenna. <laughs> Uh, and we have women in leadership and having, you know, people like Shanice in leadership roles uh, feels great because, um, you know, certainly 
uh, when you're getting put on teams, it's great to know that you're going to have the opportunity to be to take the tech lead role uh, when you're ready, and um, and that is is fantastic. She does a great job, and yeah. And so one thing we want to do today is to encourage all of you to envision yourselves in leadership roles if you're not there already. Um, it could be a manager role, could be you know a lead on an internal project, it could be an external project, it could be maybe in, uh, in the Drupal community or beyond. Um, some of us attended the, uh, the Women in Drupal lunch event last year and there was a great speaker here last year and she had the same message, which was, we need you in leadership roles. And, uh, and that was something that I took with me. And uh, a tech lead role came up at Four Kitchens. I applied for it. I got it. And now I'm you know, the first woman uh, tech lead engineer, tech lead at Four Kitchens. So yeah, we hope that all of you leave here inspired to become leaders yourselves. All right. That's enough talking for me. And I know we're past time, and so I want to just wrap us up quickly. Please grab us if, um, if, you're, if we can. Um, we'll have more time to talk, and like, um, folks will stick around if they're able, able to. Um, uh, Laura's very fancy, and she has another presentation to give, so she might have to leave us a little sooner. But I just wanted to you know, go over the common themes really quickly that we've seen here. Um, so we have that overcoming imposter syndrome. I know that's probably a big thing for a lot of us here in this room. I mean, you're looking at a woman right now who, first of all, had to get used to telling people that like, oh yeah, I went to an Ivy League school because it sounds like I'm bragging, but it's like, no, you should be proud of that. But even with that education and background, still when Sabre called me to tell me that she wanted to offer the job to someone at Four Kitchens, I was like, oh, you mean to me, right? It's like, duh, why would she be calling you on the phone? <laughs> and so, so, you know, like that's a big one. It's like we have to be able to get over those hurdles to trust ourselves and know what we know. Um, and so that creating community space is very important. Um, like uh, Laura and Sebastiana mentioned, we have um, the Women in Drupal um, or the uh, Women uh, at Four Kitchens group in Slack, but I actually found out last year at the luncheon that there's also a Women in Drupal group and I wasn't even aware of it. So I would encourage folks to, you know, get on there and jump in the group and really start to help us build the community together. And I noticed some people have been adding us on the LinkedIn, so let's definitely add each other and keep the community going um, so we can have people that support us let's you know uh, get more lead women in leadership that was a big theme for us because you know we need us to help us at the same time we know we need our male allies too but we need um, you know the ladies to really stand up and you know support the ones who are and bring the ones forward who may feel like they can't do it yet and so um, and last but not least, just that idea of lifting, um, you know, as you climb and, you know, trying to help one person come behind you, you know, at least bring somebody up with you and, um, you know, just support the people that you have that are um, caregivers because, you know, they might be able to give 100% at work, but then they still have to go and give 100% at home. And there's just not, not always a lot of percents to go around. So let's just try to support each other always and, you know, focus on that um, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and being a kind human. And um, I think there's a lot of good work that people can do together. So I'm going to stop rambling now. And <laughs> if anybody, Kelly, you can let me, question. Oh, we do. We still do have 20 minutes for a question. So I thought we were kind of at time. So feel free um, to, you know, ask um, what you have, and then we'll either get your microphone if we, if you need to, or you know, just stand up. I have a pre-question to get us started. Jono, you were talking about you started in social work and as a teacher. How did you did you have imposter sy syndrome when you were thinking about getting into um, tech after those? So loud and people could probably hear me if I really talk loud enough. Um, so yeah, so with me, like my imposter syndrome was definitely set up. Like um, if you look, check out the blog post that we wrote um, um, for the Four Kitchens website before we came here, there was that quote we added in that was about um, how um, there's a, like a very high percentage of like men that will apply for jobs like before they're ready. But with women, it's like, oh, I have to have 100% of all the qualifications or I'm not qualified enough, I can't do it. And so that was something I definitely felt for years. Like I had um, a girlfriend of mine who was telling me like, oh, you should come over to the tech field. We used to work at the same nonprofit called Congreso de Latinos Unidos in um, Philly, which um, serviced the majority um, Latino population, which was great work um, and great work um, that needed to be done. But 
the nonprofit paycheck was not giving what it was supposed to give, and then, you know, mama had bills to pay. So I was looking at, you know, other opportunities to increase my earning potential. So I looked into the tech field, and so that's how I got in that direction. And I really had to fight against that um, imposter syndrome to get to that point, and I did that through actually career coaching with other minority women, uh, working with w women in the field, just talking to people and seeing what opportunities were out there, and that really helped. Oh, there's a question all the way in the back. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, so um, that's an important point. If, in case folks didn't hear, um, she was saying that their um, company is hiring for something. So for folks that are hiring, um, feel free to shout that out now while we have the women in the space. Also, like we mentioned, that there is the women's group in Drupal, but there's also um, job boards in um, the Drupal Association Slack where you can add this information so that is, is very prominent for people to see and find so that when people are looking for opportunities, we can share them uh, with the people that we want to try to you know, lift up and get to the right places. Yes. Yes, Sabra. So if you're hiring, maybe toward the end, stand on this side of the room. And if you're looking, maybe walk over to that side of the room <laughs> and make that connection in person. Uh, oh, just a thought. <laughs> I see a hand right there with the stripes in the middle. So since, Laura, since you're a senior developer, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, um, let me see. So, I, so this is about mentorship and how to get mentorship outside, potentially, of, of your company. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe, you know, as a community, we could, we could think about that more and think about how, how to make ourselves available for for the community as as mentors of just you know people in sort of more senior positions that can be there to support everybody. I would just yeah. add real quick that um, never um, underestimate the power of sliding into the professional DMs of people. Yeah. So I've done that many times. Like and like I said, I am who I am. I'm in sales. I'm very comfortable talking to people. I've kind of always been that way. My sister's always telling me stop making friends with strangers. I was like, that's how they become your friends. <laughs> so like you know, uh, don't, never underestimate that. And you know, having that conversation. I would also add to that and tap into these events. Um, Elizabeth, I know you're here somewhere. <laughs> I met Elizabeth last year at DrupalCon. She just happened to come by the booth. She's also a director of projects and we set up quarterly conversations to just talk shop with each other, commiserate, all the things. And that's another way, you know, you can tap into that and schedule it, put it on the calendar. I mean, it's a connection moment, but it's also, for me, it's a, it's a professional development, you know, segue to learn more about what she's going through, how that can apply to what I'm going through and, you know, what's going on in the industry. Like, let's talk about it. So definitely use these events to your advantage on a personal level, not just professional. Hands in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Can you come up? Yeah. Yay. No, no problem. <laughs> um, so as uh, we're adopting new technology, there's a lot of different facets of AI that are coming up from a project manager standpoint or even from content strategy standpoint. What is your recommendation for navigating those conversations with like whole new teams that are jumping on board because you know, these new experts are coming into the team. Take, take that up. 
Oh, generative AI, I have so many feelings about you <laughs> and the ways in which you reinforce bias and are used to harass women and children online and amplify all of the bad things on the internet. Um, I, I don't know, it's, it's really tough, especially with this type of technology, and um, I would just make sure that if, if you are comfortable doing so and comfortable being the squeaky wheel, sort of just making sure people don't forget how easy it is for generative AI specifically to reinforce those biases just because of the way it was trained. Um, and to maybe we can even use it to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves you know like run if you if you've come up with some ideas perhaps run it through your chat gpts and say am i missing a bias here because i cannot see it and see what see what it comes up with but um yeah that that's a really tough one i have so many feelings about ai I think it also takes just a lot of that conversation going along with the squeaky wheel like the tough combos need to be had new team or not so it's it's worth having those discussions up front Let's see two hands in the back um in burgundy in the burgundy long sleeve shirt with the glasses <laughs> i'll meet you halfway Hey, I really appreciate this because God knows I thought I was the only one for a long time. And uh, I was wondering if you had any comments about how to deal with those who are still living in the 1950s and think that they are the best of the best and, you know, that everything is still Mad Men. Because uh, I have seen an evolution uh, throughout my career. So things are definitely getting better, I think. But uh, it's only recently that it's more of the, wow, that's what you call it, microaggression. Okay, I get it. You know, like I didn't know there were names for these things. Seriously, DEI was a big mind exploding kind of thing for me because, oh, that's what happens when you did that? Oh, my God. I didn't know there was a name for this. So uh, just more on those kinds of experiences have how do you deal with those who are still living in the 50s? Oh, microaggressions. That's like one of those ones that's the, the death by a thousand cuts that just, you know, seeps in and it can be really awful. And it, not so micro. Right, and it can be not um, as readily apparent to other people who are not directly affected by those microaggressions. So... Um, I've definitely been that, in that space a lot of times in my life. And like, again, that's one of those things that does come from the top down a lot. Like you have to have people in leadership who have the buy-in who maybe will help gear up a DEI practice. If you don't, if your org is not big enough to, to have like a DEI person on staff, you know, work with a contractor to come in and do those trainings. We actually had just had a bystander training at Four Kitchens um, that was, you know, all about like how we can help uh, mitigate microaggressions and how we can turn a conversation um, in another direction so that it helps um, you know, the person who may be experiencing those microaggressions and at the same time teaching people how to follow up and make sure you're supporting that person um, so that they don't feel like they're just out there on a limb by themselves. So like, you know, it takes some people um, to be, you know, I think upstarts that are like maybe not in the leadership position to kind of make those, um, make that noise if it's safe for them to do so because everybody has to be also mindful I always remind people that you know not everybody works at a place that is you know safe for them to you know um, make be the squeaky wheel because um, you might not get the grease you might just get kicked out so like that's also something to be mindful of too but I think you know getting that um, leadership buy-in and also having some people who have that safety to uh, speak up is something that will help volumes because people are just going to keep doing what they're doing um, if like nobody tells them they're wrong. Question? Let me come to you. All right, it's kind of the cliche question, but I'm not look looking for cliche answers. Like specific answers of like, you know, advice you'd give to someone 10 years ago or, you know, yourself 10 years ago. Do you have a moment in your past, like, like I think you were talking about, you're like, oh, I, have, I applied for the role and then I got it. Do you have something in your past that you can point to that said, this is what I did that turned the tide for me? And what advice would you give? 
Do you mean turn the tide in terms of like getting into tech or feeling more comfortable or? Okay, so for me, I know I mentioned like career coaching and that was one of those things that like the minute I decided I was like, okay, I need to make a transition and um, social work is very different than working in the tech space. Um, so how do I do that? So it was like, that's when it, the switch flipped and I was like, oh, I have all this experience but I need help and support parlaying myself into um, you know what I want to do for my next step. Also, I, I realized as I went through it, I was like, I low key have PTSD from working at horrible places where I was only black woman there, and people called me everything but an angry black woman to my face constantly, even though I was probably like one of the nicer people that worked on different staffs, and it really like hurt. So like doing um, career coaching was like therapy for like my career, and so that was um, something that really helped me a lot. I'll pass the mic for some. I would say for me, once you get to a point in your career where you're doing something really well, for me there was no reason not to do more and take it to the next level. Um, it's easy to stay comfortable and do what you do great all the time, but for me it's a, it's a growth thing. It's like, okay, I've maxed out here and the only way I'm gonna grow is if I do put myself in an uncomfortable space. And that was applying for the director of projects role. It was very uncomfortable and I didn't think I had a shot in hell um, just because that was the narrative that I had clung onto into my, in my head and, and what I was thinking about. So it's one of those things where the leap of faith has to be there in terms of yourself, but then you also just have to be like, screw it, I'm doing it. Like, I, I have the chops for it, and why not? So, and it's one of those things where had I not gotten the position, it would have been something where I would have probably asked why. <laughs> I would have wanted to know why, just so that I could have approached things differently in the sense of like, okay, there might be other things I still need to work on and learn and grow from in another way. Uh, but you can't be shy of the rejection either, just as much as you can't be shy to throw yourself in there. I very much uh, had a situation <laughs> where I would do amazing work. I'm really good at my job. Um, but then I would be like, yeah, but, but everybody knows what I know. You know, you just start minimizing and my husband called me out on it. He was like, if one of your male coworkers was doing this, like, do you think he's sitting there telling himself that his work isn't amazing? Like, why are you, why are you downplaying yourself? Like, you're good. I was like, oh, I, I might need to actually work on this. Dear therapy, let's have some conversations. And so I really took that on as like, I need to invest in myself and um, actually believe all of the nice things that people tell me about, about myself and my work. And then just lean into it. So something like this, I never would have uh, participated on a panel before because like me, who wants to hear me talk about things? But um, yeah, sometimes you just have to say F it. Like, come on, we're all rock stars here. Think of how much harder we all had to work to get to the positions we are now. Let's, let's go kick some butt. Yeah, for me, there was no sort of one moment. It was sort of a collection of little moments. And it was just sort of like all of the, the leadership type growth things that you can do. Speaking, leading teams, you know, that sort of like incrementally chips away at the giant imposter syndrome. At least that's, that's the way that it's worked for me in my experience. And just one more quick thing on that because these two ladies mentioned it too, it's like, um, and we mentioned it before, like finding that community. So sometimes it's hard, like I'm not trying to be the extrovert that's just trying to tell people just like, oh, talk to X, Y, B person and do this and do that and go ahead and speak in front of like 100 people at a conference because that might not be everybody's ministry. Mm -hmm. And as much as people think like, oh, I'm so comfortable in front of people, it's not always mine. But like I knew that I needed to find a community. So it was actually funny because I think it was me, Shanice and Laura that had like a simultaneous thought being like, we should present together at DrupalCon. And then so like we all messaged each other on Slack and started getting this thread going. And then, like I said, I like the, the Philadelphia foolishness. So then I was like, I have to pull Sebastiana in on this too. And so, and here we are. So I didn't have to feel nervous about, um, you know, because I wanted to lean into speaking at a conference. So I was like, well, other people are doing it. I think I can do it. But, you know, I, I quite frankly, I didn't want to do it by myself for the first time. So then it was nice to have like the support to have people with me and to feed off the positive energy because that's something that like definitely fuels me. Um, a few more minutes. I saw there was somebody at the table with the tag um, person, or maybe I'll just come to you. Here, come on, meet me halfway, meet me in the middle. Sorry. 
right? Hi. I'm a developer and I work with a group of really well-meaning men. <laughs> and um, I've, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I found that I'm in my first leadership position that I've been in. And I have found that I've been suggested a lot of things that are very heavily gendered, such as like I get asked to maybe write the regression tests or like make things look pretty. And if someone asked me like, oh, do you actually do any coding in your role? Which was weird. But like, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you had experience either as a developer or not as a developer. Um, handling people who are supportive and want to see you succeed, but are doing it like very poorly. <laughs> oh, good intentions. Uh, yeah. Yes, not your mama's HR. I might let some words slide, and I'm sorry in advance. Um, number one, there's my favorite phrase, which I say to my 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 BFF colleague Elia here, when you, like honestly, there are times when you just need to say it, like get bent. <laughs> but for those of us who need to be diplomatic and like professional women, um, you know you see those celebrities that are being interviewed and it's all about like, how are you managing the new baby in your career? And they say, would you have asked that if I was a man? So there are moments in conversations at work where you don't have the emotional energy to put in the work to educate that person at length. But you definitely have the space in that moment to say, could you ask one of the other men on the team to do that task? Because I'm sure not just myself, I'm sure I'm not the only one who can recognize if something is pretty. Like, very, like, and maybe if that sounded passive aggressive, you can, like, fluff that a little, <laughs> right? But there are ways just in the moment to say, or if it's like, they use a word that's like, real, like the B word, don't get me started. But if someone says that word at work, I'm like, mm, let's find another word that doesn't degrade women, women immediately. And we move on. Like, in the moment, just, like, make the quick note of, like, mm, let's not say that, maybe say this instead, and steer the conversation. Like, find a way to keep things moving, but also speak up for yourself. And then if you have a manager that supports you, say, like, I feel like this person is trying to help, but they're making it all about the fact that I'm a woman. Can it just be about the work and about the skill that I have and all of these other things that got me where I am? Because, yes, I'm a woman, but I also, like, could kick their ass up and down the, you know, whatever it is, sales floor, Drupal code things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think like, and especially if you're working closely with these people, at a certain point, you like checking them quickly will also help build trust, even if it doesn't feel like it's gonna build trust. So start from a place of like, hi, I work with you and I wanna collaborate with you and I need you to trust me and I need to trust you so let's find a better way to communicate with each other. Okay go. And um, we're gonna wrap up um, pretty much um, in the next few minutes but I just wanted to add um, to um, some things that Sabre said and um, just reiterate again like if you're not um, safe to do some of those things or if you really feel like the culture of your organization will not be welcoming to any of those things no matter how much how diplomatic you think you're saying it um, you know lean into like talking to a DEI professional lean into suggesting maybe oh maybe we could have a training on X Y thing and try to get pull a third party into it to help you because sometimes people don't like being shown who they are but sometimes that's what they need to grow and to stop getting on our nerves to say the very <laughs> least so um, with that um, I'm gonna wrap we're gonna wrap up but like we definitely encourage people to chat with us more stop by the four kitchens booth um, I will stay for a few minutes definitely if anybody wants to chat or talk about anything and I'm sure we'd be happy to connect with you um, on the ground in Portland and when we go back to our perspective areas. So thank you so much everybody. We really appreciate your time. Also, I'm going to be at uh, Contrib Day if anyone wants to have a
women's uh, contrib corner with me. That'd be awesome. Did Laura just offer to be a mentor for women in Drupal? That's what I heard. That's what I heard. 